My name is Bruce Vaughn. I'm vice chairman of the Committee for the Republic. Yes. Uh, and I welcome everyone today for hazarding the inclement weather and uh, treacherous sidewalks to get here. I know it's an ordeal, especially in Washington, one snowflake sends terror to the bureaucracy. Yes. We're gathered tonight to be undeceived of the Orwellian propaganda of the Israeli lobby, the Biden administration, Congress, and university campuses about the ongoing October 7th Israeli war in Gaza that has endured for more than 100 days. This grisliness has no end in sight. Our speakers display fearless intellectual depth and moral courage. Miko Pelid, who I'm told is on his way up from the parking lot, and <laughs> Max Bingenthal, who's here in the front row. They accepted ostracism within their communities as the price of speaking truth to power. The committee celebrates citizens who have what it takes to declare the emperor has no clothes. As we would not give equal time to proponents and detractors of the force of gravity or Newton's laws of motion, we do not give equal standing to truth and its opposite. We will be enlightened by Miko and Max across a full spectrum of front burner issues. Israel, Palestine, genocide, Netanyahu's motives and maneuvers, the expansion of the war to the West Bank, Syria, Lebanon, the Red Sea, and now Iran. The idolatry of Zionists and the criminal complicity of President Biden and Congress in Israel's indiscriminate killing. That's our government. Our two speakers are masters of their subjects, like Brandeis and Holmes on free speech. Thomas Jefferson wrote in the Declaration of Independence, let facts be submitted to a candid world. Judaism is a religion a subscription to the 613 mitzvahs enumerated in the Torah. It is not a racial category. It is not a nation state. It is the worship of God that transcends national boundaries. Anti-Zionism is not anti-Semitism. It is a defense of Judaism in its most pristine, unsullied state. By any rational application of the Genocide Convention ratified in 1951, Israel is committing genocide in Gaza. You read Section 2 of the Genocide Convention, which I'll recommend. Genocide is not an idiosyncratic concoction of any individual. It states genocide includes the quote, deliberate creation of conditions of life calculated to physically destroy million, uh, any group in whole or in part. Here, 2.3 million Palestinians in Gaza, in whole or in part. There is now pending a genocide lawsuit in the International Court of Justice brought by South Africa. We probably will get a preliminary ruling within a few weeks. The Israeli government has made Gaza uninhabitable. No food. No water, no medicine, no hospitals, no shelter, no place to hide. Even churches and Israeli hostages waving white flags, shouting in Hebrew, are fair game for the IDF. The United States has criminally aided and abetting Israel's genocide with billions of dollars of military aid, intelligence, and diplomatic support in the United Nations Security Council. We, as citizens of the United States, 
have a duty to speak out against what our government is doing. To idle in the face of genocide is to, is to disrespect George Washington, Thomas Jefferson, James Madison, Patrick Henry, among other giants of the American Revolution. They all gave or risked that last full measure of devotion to make liberty the rule of law and march of the mind the glory of the United States. Now we have Max Blumenthal will present first and then we'll have Meek. <coughs> up here it's hot I blame the Mossad for that let me get that water it's like red fox up here in my whiskey thank you all for coming out today especially want to thank Bruce for that really warm introduction on such a cold night and uh john henry for pulling this together john pulled together my talk at the national press club on goliath uh the great chas freeman and uh and uh norman actually it was norman birnbaum who introduced me there wasn't it it was so all right uh you know in memory of norman i, I really wish you were here tonight but so many good friends are here and as always, it reminds me to never trust anyone on under 30. <laughs> I'm a little under the weather. So. Bear with me, how much time do I have? 15 minutes? Oh, okay. I'm gonna have to cut this down severely. I actually didn't think I would be, let me set a timer then. I didn't think I would uh, be speaking at this point in the war. It's been a hundred days. Um, and, uh, you know, I've been talking about this for years and years and years. Operation Protective Edge. Remember in 2014, large parts of Gaza were destroyed. Hundreds and hundreds of children and women were killed in 51 days. I wrote a book about it, 51 Day War. I did a film killing Gaza. And, uh, it, 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 I mean, this film, Killing Gaza, really sets the stage for what you see now. Which, which is just 51 days, but an intensification, a full-on genocidal plan. And did anyone who asks you now, do you condemn Hamas? Did they condemn anything that has taken place before October 6th? I mean, we're talking about one military assault on Gaza after another since Gaza was placed under siege in 2005, supposedly during a withdrawal placed under the Panopticon system. Israel controls its airspace, its perimeters, its, its sea. There's no freedom of navigation for Gaza's fishing industry. Israel places a, a Gazan citizens or residents, they are not citizens of any state, under a, what Dove Weissglass, an advisor to former Israeli Prime Minister Ehud Olmer, called uh, the Gaza Diet. We will thin them out, but won't allow them to starve. And so Israel employed complex mathematical formulas to calculate what each resident was allowed, which caloric intake they're allowed. Now the caloric intake is zero. Most people in Gaza are surviving off one meal a day. The pressure at the border will become unbearable and we will have to kill and kill and kill all day, every day. That is what Arnon Sofer who helped design the siege of Gaza, an Israeli academic and demographer, said in 2005 as the siege went into effect. So let's move to October 6th, not October 7th, October 6th. Gaza was under siege. National Security Director Jake Sullivan at the Aspen Security Conference declared that the Middle East had never been quieter under Biden's watch. And they were moving liberally and freely without any bother in the world towards full normalization between Saudi Arabia and Israel, a peace between the rich that would place the Palestinians, the Palestinian problem in the historical icebox forever. On October 6th, Gaza was desperate, ignored, isolated. Hamas, which was running Gaza, as I've seen on 
multiple trips there, like any other government in the Middle East, maybe more effectively than um, some of them. You know, they had people out there directing traffic, running health ministries and so on. They had no diplomatic channels. They were declared a terrorist movement. They had no way of forcing negotiations to end this siege. And they were expected to continue to remain under siege and occupation forever as we saw the highest number of killings by Israeli occupation forces in the West Bank many times since the Second Intifada. As we saw Al-Aqsa, the Al-Aqsa compound, the third holiest site in Islam, invaded again and again with worshippers brutally beaten. So the strategic rationale for October 7th was devised by Yahya Senwar, Prime Minister of Gaza, now in a tunnel, maybe living under disguise, who is the architect of the prisoner swap for Gilad Shalit, who was the Israeli uh, soldier taken captive in 2006, released in 2011, for 1,027 captives, including Yahya Senwar, who was the lead negotiator from inside prison. He had spent most of his life in an Israeli jail, fluent in Hebrew. That's why he's prime minister. The goal was to get hostages so that you can force negotiations that have been denied to you, force diplomacy, and wipe out the Gaza division that is enforcing this siege, this criminal siege that has killed your sons and your mothers and your families. And that is precisely <clears throat> what took place on October 7th when Israeli military bases from Raim to Nahalaz were overtaken, the Gaza division was wiped out, Eras crossing, the home of the Gaza siege, where Kogat, which de devised the complex mathematical formulas, was overtaken, wiped out by a guerrilla army entering Israel on cheap Chinese motorbikes. This was not just a shattering of Israel's psychological security blanket, it was a political scandal of unprecedented proportions. Israel's military intelligence apparatus and spy tech that it exports throughout the world exposed as a paper tiger. Palestine placed back at the center of history and normalization between the Gulf monarchies, and I don't care what Prince Faisal said in Davos today, the normalization is off the table. Israel's borders were temporarily shrunken for the first time since 1973 in the south, which is a closed military zone, and in the north by Hezbollah, which has entered the conflict. So what does Israel do? How does it respond? Well, first it responds with its own psychological war, which has been waged on us as well as its own population, its own narrative of October 7th, the worst killing of Jews since the Holocaust, beheaded babies, a woman whose fetus was cut out of her pregnant woman, an entire family tied together, mutilated and killed while Hamas militants all ate lunch. All repeated by Joe Biden, who falsely claimed to have seen photographs of this, and Tony Blinken, all to justify genocide and prevent a ceasefire, all false. Most, most origin of this, and, and let's not, let's be clear, as Obama would say, let me be clear, but now I'm gonna, be completely convoluted unless I'm reading off a teleprompter. Um, Hamas did shoot people. They did kill civilians on October 7th. I am not denying that. But Israel couldn't stick with that case. They had to go further in order to evoke the Holocaust in the imaginations, the tra traumatized imaginations and psyche of its own population, and to compel Western support for what it was about to do, which was going to be uh, essentially a convening of an Einsatz group in reenactment society in Gaza. So where did these where did these uh, tall tales come from? One organization mostly called Zaka, an ultra orthodox supposed rescue group with no coronary credentials, which claimed to show up in the southern communities of Israel. A guy named Yossi Landau, you'll see him quoted prominently in the New York Times, who confirmed the beheaded baby story. No beheaded babies ever materialized spread the lie of a fetus cut from a pregnant woman and continues to lie. Uh, yesterday, yesterday, the New York Times published a puff piece on his organization, Zaka, which has just raked in a $3 million donation from Russian billionaire Roman Abramovich and a $125,000 donation from Mark Zuckerberg. All thanks to these lies which have raised their profile. Yesterday, the New York Times, Yossi Lando said he found a woman stabbed in her genitals. There are, there are physical records of what took place on October 7th to everyone, names of the victims, and none of this has ever been registered. There's no physical evidence. 
Zaka is at the center of the Hamas mass rape uh, PSYOP, which is being pushed by the Israeli Foreign Ministry through reliable vehicles like Hillary Clinton and Sheryl Sandberg, who appeared at the United Nations to uh, spin this out at the Israeli mission, that Hamas used rape as a strategic weapon on October 7th. There is no documentation of any rape, no testimony from any rape victim, so, so anyone who said they're a rape victim. The Israeli government said, well, we can't provide you with any of them, to, to journalists who asked, because they're all dead or in mental institutions. You can't hear from them. So we get very lurid testimonies from supposed eyewitnesses who suddenly surface months after the fact in the New York Times in a piece published called Screams Without Words by Jeffrey Gettleman, who is noted for admitting to fabricating quotes in a story about Robert Mugabe's government in Zimbabwe, which actually got Zimbabweans locked up in prison. We have the lead person in the Jeffrey Gettleman article in the New York Times, the woman in the black dress, Gal Abdush, who was found dead on October 7th next to her car. Her whole family, much of her family, her sister and her brother-in-law have come out and denounced the New York Times for manipulating them and for inventing the story that she was raped and said it was basically impossible. We've debunked this in detail at the New York Times along with this whole story. But the purpose of this, of these atrocities, these extreme <coughs> atrocities, is this is a genocidal conspiracy. It is to use the media and our governmental figures and people we supposedly trust, especially liberals and particularly feminists because the progressive base for Joe Biden does not support this war. It's to use them to compel our support for this genocidal assault. And so we have to be critical about it. When we hear about all these burned bodies on October 7th, and again, this is not to deny that Hamas killed many people, non-combatants, as it took them captive. It all points to something much darker and more scandalous. Was it possible for Hamas to have reduced all of those homes in Kibbutz Berry to rubble with Kalashnikovs and rocket-propelled grenades? Or did something else take place? Like what Tuval Escapa, who was the member of the security team for Kibbutz Berry in southern Israel, said when he told the Israeli newspaper Haaretz, the commanders in the field made difficult decisions, including shelling houses on their occupants in order to eliminate the terrorists along with the hostages. Look at the homes in this kibbutz, which is now being turned into a de facto second Holocaust museum, a new Yad Vashem by Israel. Welcoming everyone from Elon Musk to Jared Kushner. Those homes were destroyed by tank shells, Israeli tank shells. And we now have video of Israeli tanks firing on homes, which they knew contained Israeli citizens in this kibbutz, the Pesi Cohen home, 15 Israelis were killed in one tank shell strike. We know that because uh, an Israeli actually survived. Two Israelis survived, and they described that in Israeli media, that the Israeli special forces killed everyone in that home who had been held captive, and they knew they were going to kill them. They eliminated everyone, including the hostages, said a survivor, Yasmin Porat. So they even shelled their own military bases at the Erez crossing with a missile. This is something that Colonel Nof Erez, who was an Israeli Air Force officer operating on October 7th, called Mass Hannibal. Hannibal is a reference to the Carthaginian general who poisoned himself rather than being taken captive. The Hannibal Directive is a semi-secret, now well-known, once secret Israeli directive to attack or kill Israeli captives, if they're taken by Palestinians or the enemy, to prevent a painful prisoner swap like the one which saw Gilad Shalit exchanged for over 1,000 Palestinian political prisoners, including Yahya Senwar, the Prime Minister of Gaza. So now you have over 200 captives. People are being taken captive in ways they never have before on October 7th. What does Israel do? Well, now we know through the largest newspaper in Israel, and a correspondent, Ronan Bergman, who also contributes to the New York Times, that on October 7th, and I'm quoting directly, the IDF instructs all its fighting units in practice to use the Hannibal procedure, without clearly mentioning this name. The instruction is to stop at all costs any attempt by Hamas to return to Gaza. 
the actual meaning of the order is that the main goal is to stop the retreat of the Hamas commandos. And if they took hostages with them, then even if this means risking or harming the lives of the civilians in the area. And Ynet records that over 70 cars were destroyed by Israeli tank shells or Apache helicopter missiles on October 7th. In many cases, everyone inside the cars were killed. So look at the photos that Israel's showing everyone of all of the October 7th massacres and atrocities. It often shows people who are physically roasted inside their cars. Many of those people are not even Israelis. They were Palestinians. Many of them are Israelis who were taken captive. So now we know that many of the people killed on October 7th, among that 1,200 total that we keep hearing about, were killed by Israel using the same tactics that they're now using in Gaza because they know nothing other than indiscriminate use of heavy weapons and disproportionate force. And I keep getting called a conspiracy theorist by Israeli media. Hamas called, uh, Haaretz called me a conspiracy theorist. I got a email from the Washington Post planning to paint me as a spreader of disinformation and my colleague Aaron Mate for writing about friendly fire casualties. And for some reason that article hasn't really materialized or come out. Um, and it might be because of the preponderance of evidence from Israeli media. Uh, let me check my timer. I'm still on October 7th and I think it's 100 <laughs> days later. I got two minutes left. Okay. I think I can wrap this up and Miko will. Big picture. What? Big picture. Big picture. Well, I want to just get the big picture on, on this propaganda campaign being waged by Israel is number one, it's believed by most, if not all, Jewish Israelis that many, many babies were beheaded on October 7th. No babies were killed on October 7th. When I say babies, plural, the plural. One baby was accidentally shot, which is horrible named Myla Cohen, 11 months old, in Kibbutz Berry. So whenever you hear like Jake Tapper or Joe Biden or whoever say babies were killed, you know they're lying just based on these evidence that we have. Clear Israeli evidence. Records. Yes, the Israeli records, you can find these records at, at Haaretz, um, the Israeli Social Service of Security Administration, it's all there. Um, but the point is to drive the Israeli, the Jewish Israeli consensus for a genocidal military assault whose objective is not the elimination of Hamas, which is impossible because they have a mass base among the population. They are the population in many ways, but the elimination of Gaza as a Palestinian entity and the disappearance of its population or what Ron Dermer, special assistant to Netanyahu called the thinning of the population. And this is what we saw with the South African presentation at the ICJ accusing Israel of having the potential to commit genocide, I've never seen more evidence of genocidal intent expressed by the leadership of a country and its population than what we've seen from Israel. And it's often not that they're caught in the act, but that they're freely broadcasting it proudly to the international public and especially to the Hebrew speaking public on TikTok, showing themselves committing war crimes. Today, we saw the Israeli military blow up 12 residential blocks in Khan Yunus on TikTok. The soldiers were flaunting it. Yesterday we saw soldiers flaunting themselves, opening up a safe in someone's house and stealing their money. $90 million has been taken from Gaza, according to the government there. You, it's, day after day, you see these videos of Israeli soldiers declaring there are no uninvolved. Senior IDF officers, Lieutenant Colonel Oren Schindler of the 74th Battalion of the 188th Brigade. We need to make sure that wherever the IDF goes in Gaza, there is devastation. There are no innocents. Heritage Minister Amihai Eliyahu, proposed dropping a nuclear weapon on Gaza and said that people in Gaza need to be dealt a fate worse than death and on and on and on. Only 1.8% of Israelis believe that Israel has used too many explosives on Gaza. According to Gaza's government, 65,000 tons of explosives have been dumped on the Gaza Strip, three times more than was used on Hiroshima. 247 Palestinians killed every day, 48 mothers, 117 children, three medics, two teachers, 10 children, two teachers killed every day and 10 children have lost one or two, one or two limbs each day. Over 1000 children have had procedures to amputate their limbs performed without anesthesia. Yesterday, a video emerged of a father who is a doctor performing an amputation on his daughter's leg without anesthesia. And, you know, I'm going to just make two points. I'm going, 
uh, and, and I'm going one minute over time, I'm going to make two points. One just about the genocide in Gaza, and then one kind of big picture point. Um, I think Q&A will be great. Um, one of the, we've been working with local journalists in Gaza to bring there's this reality on the ground to you from the gray zone. Go check out our YouTube channel and see those video reports. We as journalists from outside Gaza cannot go in. And you'll notice that mainstream journalists are not exactly lining up and pressuring their governments or the Israeli government to demand they be allowed to go in. One of the most painful stories that we reported uh, through local Palestinian journalists was of a 13 year old girl named Dunya Abu Mosin who had survived an airstrike on her home that killed much of her family. Her parents, she miraculously survived. Her leg was amputated and she was brought to Al Nasser Hospital in Khan Yunus in southeastern Gaza. And uh, she gave an interview where she said that, you know, she still had hope in life. She wanted to um, get a prosthetic and become a doctor and help other children walk again who had lost their legs because so many other of her generation had. Um, soon after that interview, and we uh, had our journalist arrive to the hospital soon after this happened, an Israeli tank shell fired on the hospital and blew her head off and killed her in her hospital bed. That tank shell was one of the 14,000 tank shells fast-tracked to Israel in a sale that bypassed Congress, presided over by Tony Blinken of the U.S. State Department. We had no say as American taxpayers, as American citizens, in whether Israel could have those tank shells. There is no, there, there, there is no restriction at all on what the U.S. government is giving to Israel. There's no transparency. And when I brought that to the doorstep of the State Department and asked the State Department spokesman last week about that, he said, no, we, 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 we notified Congress in a way, but essentially we notified them by invoking emergency law, and we told them we're invoking an emergency law to bypass the Arms Control Act. So that's what we're dealing with here. Who will stop them before they kill again? How can we stop them? The only people trying to stop them are the regional resistance, the axis of resistance, which spans from southern Lebanon to Syria to Tehran to Sana'a, in Yemen, and these are the targets of the inexorable march of neoconservatism, which was spelled out in the Project for a New American Century document. We have to see Gaza as a step on the way to the prize of taking out Iran. We have to see the regime change plot against Syria, in which the U.S. and the Gulf states and NATO funded death squads to try to remove Bashar al-Assad. We have to see the, uh, the six-year war on Yemen causing one of the world's worst humanitarian crisis, crises as an attempt to weaken Palestine and make this genocide possible. This is about imperialism. It's about empire. It's about neoconservatism. It's not just about human rights. So we have to see the bigger picture here. And I just interviewed Mohammed Abu Haiti, who is the spokesman for the Houthis. And what he said was we are waging a responsive, essentially a responsibility to protect military intervention, to protect a population that is totally defenseless, and we're using any means at our hands when most Arabs are completely hopeless under the control of dictators. We fought a revolution in our country to be able to do this and stand up for our brothers. And what they're doing is choking shipping at its most vital point in the Red Sea in Bab al -Manda in a largely bloodless military operation to stop a genocide. This is the first time in my life, one of the first times I have seen a moral military intervention because in my country, all the military interventions which have been waged by the liberal humanitarian interventionist R2P crowd inspired by the writings of Samantha Power, the people who are in the Biden White House have, re have, have, have caused nothing but destruction and instability. And so this is what the Biden administration has created. On this, this is the cycle the Biden administration has created with its refusal to call for a ceasefire. It can end all of this, this cycle of escalation by just doing a ceasefire, but they can't do it. So they're bombing Yemen to stop the one movement which controls most of this country from intervening to stop a genocide. The bombing of Yemen is designed to prolong and preserve the worst most obvious genocide that I have ever witnessed. Who will stop them before they kill again? People in the region are going to take up arms 
to stop Israel before they kill again. That's what's happening, and we have been rendered voiceless here. So what the reason we're here tonight is to get our act together and figure out what we're going to do this year to stop this and to get in the way of the inexorable, inexorable march of neoconservatism. Thank you. Yeah, Q and A is going to be really important. <laughs> all right, it's always better when you get a All right, good evening, and uh, it's a hard act to follow after Max. Thank you all for being here. Sorry I was late. It's harder to get an Uber these days than uh, or today with the snow, and that's why I was late. So I apologize. Um, again, thanks, Max. I only caught half of about uh, half of that. Well, that was pretty powerful. Like I said, a hard act to follow. <clears throat> you know, if we had a choice, which we, like Max, I think, illustrated very clearly, if we did have a choice, what would we want to see happen? It's our taxpayers, by any, it's our, you know, we pay the salaries, we pay uh, out of our taxpayers, we pay the Navy, we pay the military, we pay the government, we pay our representatives, we vote for our representatives. So I, for one, would like to see the Sixth Fleet, which, as I'm sure you know, is in the Mediterranean, come in to stop Israel and provide humanitarian aid to uh, humanitarian aid to Gaza. Over two million people have been being massacred in broad daylight on prime time. The Sixth Fleet is right there; they can stop it right now and provide necessary. Beyond necessary, like crucial humanitarian aid to these two million people that have never done anything wrong. Say what you will about the resistance, say what you will about what happened on October the 7th. Nothing, nothing on the face of the earth justifies this savage slaughter of innocent civilians. Nothing does. And the six fingers right there, they can stop it, provide humanitarian aid. Declare a no-fly zone over Gaza, and at least stop the killing, if nothing else. So, where are our voices? We're paying for this. Our elected officials are voting for this. How is this even possible that we, as taxpayers, as we, that we, as people who are part of what's supposed to be a, a, a democracy, it's our elected officials that are voting to do this. I remember, Max mentioned the 14,000 tank shells. I remember when this was announced, the 14,000 tank. Uh, there's something about that number that just, I couldn't get rid of it. It was like in haunting me. 14,000 tank shells for what? There's no tank. Palestinians have never had a tank. Palestinians have never had a war plane. Palestinians never had an army. Never in the history have ever had an army. Yet we are believing, we're buying into this complete nonsense that somehow Israel is defending itself. From what? From what? A bunch of guys with flip-flops and an AK-47. That's it. And a handful of bullets. And we're talking about big picture here. Fine. Let's, let's, let's expand the picture here a little bit. The genocide of the Palestinian people has been going on since the State of Israel was established. In other words, actually before the State of Israel was established. As soon as the United Nations passed this ridiculous resolution of partitioning Palestine, it was the end of November 1947, a well thought out, well planned, and very well executed campaign of genocide and ethnic cleansing began in Palestine. Now, what is so cynical about this? This was three years after the end of the Holocaust. Three years after the end of the Holocaust, the world allowed, the world allowed a campaign of ethnic cleansing and genocide to take place in Palestine, which is three hours flight from, from, from Berlin, four hours flight from Paris. It's not some place at the end of the world that nobody can see or hear. It was right there. 
How could we possibly let this happen? Three years after the end of the Holocaust. And as we know, in case anybody has any doubts, we know this because Amnesty International told us, an apartheid regime was put in place over Palestine. And this new regime was called Israel. So, of course, because it's Israel and it's so biblical, we can't say anything about it. How could we possibly resist? How could we possibly claim anything bad about this biblical creation, which is Israel? For 75 years, my father was an officer in 1948. When I hear Palestinians, many of them are in Gaza, because he, he, was, he operated mostly in the southern part of the country, who come from these villages that I know my father participated in those so-called battles, if you want to call them battles. It was a campaign of ethnic cleansing against a nation that has no military. But fine, let's assume they were battles. I cringe. I cringe. Villages and towns, they were no, they are no longer there. Gone. Gone. And people treat this like it was some kind of a military, I don't know, miracle. People who don't believe in miracles, by the way. People are completely secular and don't believe in God. Suddenly believe that that was a miracle. And then the miracle came back, by the way, in 1967, when Israel's massive military force assaulted its neighbors and in five days managed to triple the size of the state of Israel and kill 18,000 Arab soldiers. How can we possibly allow this to happen? Where were we? It's been going on for 75 years. Now, right now, the focus is on Gaza, as it well should be. But let's talk big picture. There are 2 million Palestinian citizens of Israel. No one, no one dares to leave their home. No one dares to send a message, a text message. No one dares to post on social media. Doctors, engineers, uh, you know, teachers, principals, people are fearful of their life. You know why? Because their life is cheap. Because, as we all well know, the Israeli government has been handing out M16s to citizens. And if you kill a Palestinian, who may be wander, wandering around in Tel Aviv, there'll be no recourse. There's nowhere to go with that. Even if that Palestinian happens to be a citizen of Israel. When the Palestinian fighters came out of Gaza on October the 7th, they basically were able to capture all of southern Palestine. The entire southern part of the country, called the Naqab, or the Negev as Israel calls it, a great deal, I think most of the Refugees in the Gaza Strip come from that part of the country, the southern part of Palestine. There are 300,000 Palestinian citizens of Israel who live in that part of the country. They are the poorest of the poor among Israeli citizens. The Naqab, which is, supposedly, which is basically a desert, is a very fertile desert. Israeli settlements, cities, towns, kibbutzim, like we heard, enjoy some of the highest standards of living in that part of the country. You know why? Because it's very fertile. And agriculture, of course, is subsidized anyway. If I go back there tomorrow as an Israeli citizen, I can, I can lease a ranch and I can grow anything I possibly want. I will have all the water I want, all the subsidies I want. Palestinians, whose land that was, and are now living in basically townships, are not allowed to engage in agriculture. These are farmers. The Palestinian Bedouin are farmers. They're not allowed to engage in agriculture. Now, on a no this is on a normal day. This has got nothing to do with it now. This is on normal when things are good. More than 2,000 homes are demolished just in that part of the country on a regular basis before October 7. You know how many of those homes are Jewish homes? Anybody want to guess? Yeah. Zero. How could that be? You mean Israeli Jews never break the law? They never build without a permit? I know people who build without a permit. You think the army comes and demolishes their home? No. This is kept only for Palestinians, and these are citizens of Israel. And that's only that part of the country. Another 40,000, 40,000 home demolition orders, which are now being fast-tracked, 
for the Israeli, for the Palestinian citizens of Israel in other parts of the country. That excludes the West Bank, excluding Jerusalem. And that was the good old days. That was before October 7th. Before October 7th, Israel had some 6,000 political prisoners. They doubled that number after October 7th. Every Palestinian friend I have has been, has been, uh, has been arrested. Some were released, some were not. Everybody was beaten and tortured. I just interviewed Isa Amro from Hebron, probably one of the most important, most courageous leaders of Palestinian uh, civil disobedience and unarmed resistance in Palestine. The kind of guy that makes Martin Luther King proud and Nelson Mandela proud as they look down on him. He was beaten, tortured, sexually abused on October the 7th. In Hebron, as in the other cities throughout the West Bank, Palestinians have an hour in the morning and an hour at night to leave their homes. Why? Because the abuse, and I just spoke to Isa the other day, I just interviewed him. The abuse they have seen before October 7th seems like the good old days. He said it's a whole new level of joy that the Israeli soldiers and settlers are expressing now as they catch and, and, and beat up and torture Palestinians. A whole new level. Why? Palestinians in Jerusalem, if you don't know, they have their own status. They're not citizens and they're not part of the West Bank. They're kind of in their own, you know, I always say, you know, I have Palestinian friends in Jerusalem whose families have been in Jerusalem consistently for 800 years, recorded. They have no citizenship, they have no rights. If they leave for a couple of years, they're gone. Their, their status is gone, their rights are gone, their property is gone. I've been gone for 30 years, I can go back to Jerusalem tomorrow like nothing happened. My grandparents immigrated 100 years ago from you know Eastern Europe. And these were the good old days. So now, finally, the world has woken up. Finally, we see Israel being taken to court, to the ICJ. Finally, accusations of genocide are presented, and Israel has to defend itself, finally. Which is doing, if, if anybody's been paying attention, clearly they've been doing a very poor job at defending themselves. Because how could you possibly, possibly defend yourselves? The stories that Max reiterated, I won't repeat, Ad nauseum, when clearly the evidence shows that none of that happened. And even if it did, even if it did, 25,000 innocent civilians dead? Is that justified? Not to mention the fact the Palestinian fighters in Gaza are still fighting. They're still fighting. People say, well, they have an objective to destroy Hamas, to bring down Hamas, to eliminate this, to move that, as though there's some kind of a strategy, as though there's something here that makes sense. The Israeli military was humiliated once again on October the 7th, just as it was exactly 50 years and one day before that, in 1973. Some of us are old enough to remember the October 1973 war when the Israeli military was surprised and humiliated. And why are they humiliated? Because the Arabs wouldn't dare. This is what we're taught. This is what we believe. The Arabs wouldn't dare. Well, every time they dare, they succeed. Every time they dare, they succeed. The Israeli military was proven clearly to be nothing more than a paper tiger. The great Israeli intelligence apparatus. Nothing more than a paper tiger. Every time they're put to the test, they're humiliated and they fail. Well, this time they decided, just like any gangster would, just like any mobster would, to take revenge on the weakest, most defenseless victims, the Palestinians in the Gaza Strip. Now, the official number, I think, from... Palestinian sources in Gaza is about 23, 24,000 dead. The, estim the people estimate, estimate that there are at least 50,000. 
because they haven't uncovered. They've not yet uncovered all the debt. It's impossible to do that when all the bombing and so forth is taking place. How can we sit here and pay for this? How can we sit here in Washington, D.C. and allow this to happen? It's been 75 years. Three years after the Holocaust. Genocide, ethnic cleansing, and apartheid. Three crimes defined as crimes against humanity being committed by a state that we pay almost $4 billion a year in foreign aid. Never mind the fact they don't need foreign aid. It's a rich country. It's a rich country. Israel doesn't need foreign aid. And now this. I have to say this, my friends. Clearly. <laughs> Clearly. As Max was saying. There are two options when it comes to the Israel-Palestine question. Two options and none more. Believe me. I was born and raised in Jerusalem. My father was a general in 1967. Then he dedicated his life to this idea of the two-state solution, whereby Palestinians would enjoy their own, you know, the right to self-determination in the small part of the, their, their own land of Palestine, which is the West Bank and the Gaza Strip. Israel did everything it possibly could to make sure that never happens. You know, they call it the six day war, but actually it was a five day war. The war ended after five days. You know why they call it six days? If you open the Jewish prayer book, and I know you had Rabbi Shapiro here, if you open the Jewish prayer book, the term six days of creation, six days of creation, six days of creation, it was a miracle. The six day war was a miracle. That's why they call it a six day war. It was a, a war that ended in five days. On the fifth day of that war, my father stood up at the first meeting of the Israeli high command. Now, he was one of the generals who pushed very hard to start the war. At the end of the war, he said, okay, now we won. It's great. We give back the territories. We make peace with our neighbors, and we're done. Our children won't have to fight. And two things happened as he was saying this. Number one, his comrades in arms, it's Hakrabin and all these others, said, are you out of your mind? We just finished the job that we didn't finish when we established Israel. We got all our, all our lands. Why in the world would we make peace? Why do we want to give it back? That's one thing that happened. The second thing that happened, Israel built massively for Jews only in East Jerusalem and in the West Bank, making it impossible, impossible for the two-state solution idea to ever materialize. My father and his Navy Tank continued the rest of his life to pursue this idea as he was seeing it become less and less and less viable. The two-state solution is a myth. It never existed. There was never a chance for it. It's, there's no virtue to it anyway. I mean, I don't really know what the virtue of the two-state solution is. So we basically have two options and no other. We support the state of Israel as America does. We keep sending $4 billion a year and allow the, the genocide, the ethnic cleansing, and the apartheid to continue. And if that is, fits in with our values, then by all means. But if we want peace, and there is a recipe for peace, then we must, we must do everything we can to dismantle the apartheid state, to end the genocide, to demand guarantees for the safety and security of Palestinians, not for a short period of time, not for a ceasefire, but forever. With a political solution, a political reality that will change the way business is done. And that is a single democracy, a free Palestine from the river to the sea. And that's that. A free Palestine from the river to the sea with equal rights is the only recipe for peace between Israelis and Palestinians. The only one. Only equality. Only bringing down the apartheid and ending this, this, this slaughter of innocent civilians. Gives Israelis and Palestinians a chance, a chance to live in peace. And the only place in the world that can make that happen is Washington, D.C. Here in Washington, D.C., decisions are made about what happens there. Palestinians are doing everything they can. 
but they were like prisoners in a maximum security prison, in a concentration camp. A friend of mine from Gaza says, it used to be a concentration camp, now it's a death camp. We have to demand that our elected officials, that our tax dollars, go to bringing down and dismantling the apartheid state and establishing a democratic, free Palestine from the river to the sea with equal rights. Then we will see a peaceful, prosperous future for Israelis and Palestinians. Thank you very much. We're going to have uh, questions. Do you want us to sit up here or do you want us to sit down? No, we're, yeah, you guys come up here. Okay. Do you think that there are elements in Washington that have deliberately created a doom loop for our democracy, giving unlimited monies to something. Israel, which then purchases our legislative and executive branch? I'm sorry, what was the purpose of the question? Do you think that there are elements in Washington would have deliberately created a doom loop for our democracy by giving unlimited money to Israel, which then purchases or threatens both our legislative and executive branches. Well, I mean, it, 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 seems, it seems to me that, it seems to me that the, um, the various lobbies that work for Israel, that operate here in the United States, here in Washington, are using the system that is provided to them in America. I mean, this is this is something that's being provided to them. They're not doing anything that is unique. They have interests, they have, they have their own agendas, and they're using whatever is available to them to the fullest extent. Um, but I think, I think this goes beyond Washington, D.C. The Zionists realized very early on that in America, all politics is local. And so over 100 years ago, they began working, you know, in every city, in every state, you know, people running for school board, people running for city council, mayors, of course, police chiefs, and so on. So it starts a lot, much, much earlier than when people actually come to Washington, D.C. That's why Americans don't need to be convinced to support Israel. I mean, the pressure helps, and APAC and all these groups help. But Americans, very early on, in school, in church, I mean, everywhere they go, what they hear in the news, you know, popular culture, Israel is a good guys. That's kind of the way it is. Arabs are bad guys. And so I think it's, a, it's, it's, it's actually a lot more sophisticated and goes far back longer than most people anticipate. What happens in Washington D.C. is really just the final step, kind of the final push. Most of the work is done, I think, locally in, in, are in arenas that we don't even re realize. Arenas that we don't even realize. Um, because of that effective, but they're using the tools that the system in America provides for them, allows for them. Yeah, just to, uh, to make Miko's point, a lot of people are surprised by Senator John Fetterman being the biggest advocate for Israel in the Democratic Party. You go up to his office and it's like his whole door is plastered with pictures of the hostages. I don't know, I walked through the Senate the other day, like every door is like the hostages or a trans flag. Hostages, trans flag. That's American politics today. So, but Fetterman, he has the hostages, but he was supposed to be a progressive, you know, he wears his hoodie, he looks like uh, like Jimbo from The Simpsons, you know, you think he's like hanging out in a 7-Eleven parking lot, you might be able to reach him if you're a progressive. No, no. I mean, the other day, John Fetterman said, uh, you know, South Africa needs to... Uh, but sit this one out, the ICJ. One of the few times he showed up in the Senate was at an Israel lobby event. You don't see him here. You, he was never even at city council when he was the mayor of Braddock. And there's like 22,000 people there. He couldn't even make his way to city council. He's, he's basically a cyborg. He had a stroke. He, he needs machines to help him talk. And the Israel lobby has just taken, basically hacked his brain. But they started in Pennsylvania long ago. And right now there's a major campaign in Pennsylvania with billboards all over the state thanking John Fetterman. And it's run by the former chief of staff to Bob Casey, his predecessor in the Senate, who is a major figure for APAC, a local figure. So Fetterman was, they took Fetterman early on uh, and made him into this, this this Zionist monster who's just like take going further than Likud. 
Bobby Kennedy Jr. I mean, I, I, we can get into that later. But 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 Miko's right. There is a very strong local component to all this. Muriel Bowser here in Washington D.C. Like three or four years ago, she was taken on a trip to Israel to uh, ink uh, tech deals for Washington D.C. New uh, tech and research and development deals. So it's even happening here. So what what's going to happen if somehow the city council decides to divest from companies that are involved in the occupation? Muriel Bowser is going to veto. And who is her mentor? Michael Bloomberg. So. He's right. Hi. Um, I was, oh, is this on? Okay. It's on, let's keep it close. Mr. Blumenthal, um, you were mentioning all this other stuff. <laughs> what about that crazy story about maybe a week ago there were three hostages who actually escaped from Hamas. Um, they were screaming in, 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 in Hebrew. Um, they and took off their shirts, which I called out later is because they wanted to show they didn't have suicide vests on. Right. They held up my white legs. They all got killed. Killed anyway. Really, yeah. And then the other guy. I'm sorry. I I can't remember what your name was. But Miko Pele. Miko. I think I've seen you. Do you remember his name, but not mine. Thank you very much. <laughs> Mine's longer. <laughs> the best oh, the Jerusalem fund around ten years ago. <laughs> um, but um, the other thing about you were asking about what's um behind this. I think part of it is not necessarily the Israeli lobby. I think it would be like what some people like the defense industry or the old term military industrial complex. My understanding is not just Israel, but every country who gets military aid is required to spend about 77% of it on stuff. Yeah. Well, Amico can also field the, I mean, you're, you're a veteran of the Israeli army, right? Sadly, yes. I mean, I know you're not proud of it. Yeah. But, um, so yes, Israel, the, the Golani Brigade, just had an entire division come out of Gaza. And what did they accomplish? Well, Israel has failed in all of its stated military objectives. They have failed to release the hostages, liberate the hostages through force, and they have failed to eradicate Hamas. They won the war on Palestinian babies, however. And so the uh, Golani Brigade in Shijaya, which is an area east of Gaza City, which is really the one of the key bases of armed resistance to Israel, um, three, uh, as male Israeli hostages, captives located a unit of the Golani brigade, took off their shirts and followed all the instructions, you know, to demonstrate that they're not a threat, waved a white flag and were screaming in Hebrew. <laughs> Two were shot by a sniper and then a unit, the unit tracked the third down and killed him execution style. Why? Because that's what they do to everyone. They thought they were Palestinians, and that's what they've been doing to Palestinians. Field executions over and over. There have been so many field executions, barging into people's homes, shooting everyone. On January 11, uh, the Palestinians were killed north of Gaza City on, uh, on uh, Saladin Street, uh, trying to wait, just sitting there waiting for an aid truck because aid rarely reaches northern Gaza. And Israel sent tank fire and quadrocopter drones to kill 50 of them. I mean, just this is what's happening day after day. So they just thought they were Palestinians and killed them. So they've they, Israel has liberated maybe one hostage. They freed one hostage, and that hostage uh, has a soldier living in their house, basically all the time to prevent them from speaking to the media about what actually happened. Um, they there is a. Uh, an Israeli sociologist, uh, Yigal Levy, wrote in Haaretz that Israel is actually aiming to kill as many of, it, of the captives in Gaza as possible as an extension of the Hannibal procedure on October 7th that I explained. And it appears they've killed some 50 captives. Uh, one of them, who was filmed being taken on a motorcycle from the Nova Electronic Music Festival, uh, appeared in a hostage video yesterday that was released by the Al-Qassam Brigades, the armed wing of Hamas. And she said that two other hostages that I was with were killed in an airstrike and I was pulled out of the rubble. Hostages or captives who have been released through the negotiations have gone to the war cabinet meetings and screamed at Netanyahu and said, the only way out of this is to stop these airstrikes and negotiate because the airstrikes almost killed me and my greatest fear was being killed and that you would blame Hamas for it. They're openly saying it. There is a contingent of the Israeli public that wants them released with negotiations, 
But there is also a contingent strongly represented in Netanyahu's coalition that wants them all dead because releasing the captives directly contradicts the objective of genocide, eradicating not just Hamas, but Gaza. Miko had another, there was a question for you, which you want to let's have it. I'm Mike Springman. Is this on? Yes. Uh, I'm an attorney, author, political commentator, and former American diplomat. Uh, the current situation is presented as something new and entirely different. But does it go back to the 20s and 30s to plan Dalit of David Ben-Gurion and the Zionist uh, consultancy, where the object was to cleanse Palestine <coughs> Palestinians through blowing up houses, blowing up villages, and murdering men, women, and children? Well, the short answer is absolutely yes. There's no question about this. This is, it's, it's, uh, it is definitely part of the plan to eliminate the Palestinian people. There's no question about this. Clearly, I mean, this is, this is, this is horrifying, even by Israeli standards. I mean, Israel has, has massacred before. It had um, killed civilians. I mean, it's funny when people talk about killing civilians. There are nothing but civilians when you talk about Palestinians. Palestinians have never had an army. They've had small groups of resistance fighters, small guerrilla groups, but they've never had an army. So when Israel uh, bombs uh, refugee, used to bomb refugee camps in, in Lebanon or Syria, they're killing civilians. When they're bombing Gaza, they're killing civilians. When they raid cities in the West Bank, they're killing civilians. When they deny Palestinian citizens of Israel water and medical care, citizens of Israel, I'm not even talking about the horrific situation in Gaza, they are killing civilians. It is a multi-pronged campaign of genocide without any question. Now, if you look at the definition, of course, you know, this is a serious, this is a serious allegation, and, um, but it's fully justified. And if anybody has any doubt, the definition of genocide, of, of, of the crime of genocide is very clearly stated. And one of the things that came up at the ICJ and constantly comes up as what might be problematic about about accusing some a country of genocide is that you have to show intent. So if Israel, you know, bombs the hospital and kills everybody inside, or bombs the building and murders civilians once or twice, then it's not genocide. There's no intent. It was a mistake, maybe. When they do it consistently, like you said, where it's well planned, it's written down, it's it's expressed by every Israeli politician for 75 years that this is the intent, and then we see it happening on a regular basis then clearly there's intent. I mean, I'm not only talking about Gaza right now, there's clearly intent to, to, to massacre as many civilians as possible. But this goes on exactly like you said, it's been going on for from the very, very beginning. That was the plan. Now, on top of that, because genocide is not only killing a people, but it's also destroying their country, destroying their homes, destroying their culture, destroying their identity. Well, what happened to Palestine? Look at Anybody here ever been to uh, Thomas Jefferson's place in Monticello? If you walk into the house, to the foyer, remember there's a big map of Africa? If you look up to the north and east, what does it say? You should take a look. It says Palestine. Every map you look at prior to May 15, 1947, any plan says Palestine. Suddenly it's Israel and everybody forgot that it was Palestine. The European, Europeans and other countries were trading with Palestine. Palestine had a rich economy, a, a, a rich cultural life, a political life, cities, major cities that were taken. I'm, I know I'm, I'm kind of expanding a little bit. You know, people say that Israel, that the, the Zionists made the desert bloom. Really? You should look at air, aerial photos taken by the British of the Nakab, the desert. It was all cultivated land by the Palestinian Bedouin. Major cities, Yaffa, Haifa, Jerusalem, Akka, uh, major cities were built. The Zionists stole it all. Their people had monies in the banks. There were banks, newspapers, produce, cotton, uh, citrus fruit, olive oil, not to mention, and on and on and on. They stole it all. They didn't make the desert bloom. They stole a country that was in full bloom. But that was the intent. And then they named it, they changed the name. They called it Israel. They changed the names of cities. They changed the names of streets within the cities that they took. And then they started claiming that there's no such thing as the Palestinian people. That is all part of the genocide plan, without any question. So it does go back all the way to those years, absolutely.
they built a mental institution on Der Yassin, site of one of the worst massacres of 1948. Yeah. Yeah. What could be more symbolic than that? Yeah. Thank you. Obviously, the roots of this go back a long ways. Uh, how much would you say is within the manipulation of the Judaic faith uh, or its collision with expedient factors and other political agendas? British, others, so on. A great, all these great games. Well, I believe you guys heard Rabbi Shapiro speak here a few uh, a while back. This has nothing to do with the Jewish faith. The most important rabbis throughout history stood and resisted, and to this day resist, this notion of Zionism. In the year 1900, maybe Rabbi Shapiro mentioned this, in the year 1900, 1900, Zionism was in its infancy. The major rabbis of the world published a book in Hebrew. And that book basically was a warning to Jewish people from the dangers of Zionism. And they said basically three things. Number one, this notion of a so-called Jewish state or Zionism will bring violence to the Holy Land. And then they said, it will ruin the good relations between Jews and Arabs and Jews and Muslims that existed throughout the Arab world and in Palestine. And then they said it would cast doubt as to the loyalty of Jewish people in the countries where they live because Jewish people have been living for thousands of years as a, Jew, as a, as a religious minority in other countries. Now the very definition of Jews as a nation Again, Rabbi Shapiro may have said this, is that they are a nation united by its faith, not by a language or a country or a nationality. So none of this has anything to do with Jews. And if you look at the writings of the early Zionists, and even the expression of, of, of you know, my parents' generation as they looked at the at Jews, like religious Jews, to them, a Zionist is the opposite of a Jew. They said these words, you know. They despise Jews, traditional Jews, believing Jews. But Judaism is, of course, a faith. It's a religion. So they tried to create something that is completely, completely, uh, you know, uh, different than what Jews are and what Judaism is. They created this notion that Jews are a nation like regular nations, that the Bible, the Old Testament, is a history book that has nothing to do with faith, and that Palestine is our homeland. So that's what this is about. And of course, you know, the, the back in those days, <clears throat> the early 20th century, white Europeans giving brown people's countries to their friends was no big deal. And so the Balfour Declaration is basically that. Lord Balfour was the foreign minister of, you, of Great Britain, giving a prom, making a promise to Lord Rothschild, who was a Jewish millionaire, that he could have somebody else's country. That's how things were done. And the Socialist Bund, which was the majority of Jews in the Pale of Settlement, where my family's from, most of them were killed in the Holocaust. Uh, they were officially anti-Zionist. Well, they didn't come from the Bund, they came from the Shtetl, though. Yeah. So, um, <clears throat> I would just like to say that uh, how extraordinary it is to be in this room with two people with such depth of knowledge about this issue and how lucky we all are to hear this in Washington. Um, it seems to me uh, that the reaction now to what's happening in Gaza, in this country, I mean, addressing what you were saying about, we need a state with equal rights. This is what we need. We don't need, we can't have a two-state solution because that's been precluded by what's happened. So um, given that and the importance of the United States in making these decisions, uh, isn't it extraordinary that there are now these demonstrations with 400,000 people in Washington? Isn't it extraordinary that people now can talk about the, the history of the Palestinians in a way they never could? I mean, over many, many years, people have been completely ignorant about this. So perhaps it's a result of people like you standing up and talking about this. But what's the next step? 
Those uh, what do we do questions always baffle me. I'm just kind of a critic and a gadfly. I don't know if you. Yeah, I, I've got plenty of ideas. <laughs> I'm happy to share my ideas. What do we do next is this. You know, the protests are wonderful, clearly. But they're not going to solve the problem. Let me put it this way. If, 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 if you are an American politician today, if you're an American citizen at all, but let's, let's just, you know, say a, a decision maker, and you want to make an informed decision about this issue, you do not have the tools. Why? Because there has been a, a robust, systematic pushing of this very compelling story that supports the idea of Israel. And there's never been an equivalent on the other side. There's never been an effort made and I'm not blaming anyone, it's just the way it is. There's never been an effort even remotely, even remotely similar by the Palestinians to what the Zionists have been doing here for over 100 years. So education, you said education. These protests are important without any question. But they're not going to change the reality. They're not going to change the, what decision makers decide here in Washington, D.C. Never mind the politics, for example. Never mind the narrow-minded interests. Let's say somebody wants to make an informed decision. They do not have the information about the other side. Ask any, anybody, a politician, somebody in the street, what do they know about Palestine? Half of the people will confuse it with Pakistan. And I've seen this. I've heard this. And nothing wrong with Pakistan, of course, but it's not Palestine, right? The half that have heard of Palestine will say terrorism, maybe settlements, Israel, something that's been going on for thousands. There's no foundation of understanding. There's no foundation of education about the other story, about the other narrative, which is not only at least as compelling, not only at least as, as you know, going back in history, but it has one quality that the Zionist narrative does not have. Excuse me? The truth. The Palestinian story, which I only heard late in life, because I was raised on the Zionist, you know, pool, the Zionist stories in mega doses, of course, is the truth. So you don't need to build lies, like Max was saying, lies upon lies upon lies upon lies every day and kind of twist and turn with the lies. No, you just tell the truth. There was a country with a culture, with a history, with a people, with a language, with tolerance. It was called Palestine. And it's a history that goes back as, you know, as far as we can, any, any, any historian can, can, can write. Herodotus, the father of, 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 the, of, the, of, of, his, of history, wrote about Palestine. The name Palestine, referring to that country, goes back thousands of years. That does not exist. There's no one educating, there's no one promoting it in a way that can compete with the other side. And that, I believe, is the effort, and it's something that I've actually kind of been talking to some people here in Washington to see about, about creating. There is no institution, no state, no, no, nobody. There's no, no organized effort to present that. And until that's presented, we're not going to be seeing any change in the decision-making uh, levels because people just don't know. Now, I'll say one more thing, and that is that it's not only it's not just about making a compelling story and telling the truth, but it's doing it in a way that can actually move people to say, you know what, well, we've got something here we need to consider. <coughs> people ask me very often, how do we put Palestine front and center? Because Israel is front and center. So this young man that I know who happens to be Palestinian and he works as an intern in one of the senator's offices. And he just very casually were having a conversation. He said, you know, we get 300 emails every day from Stand With Us, which is a Zionist organization. 300 emails every day, every senator, every congressperson, every member of Congress, I'm sure the White House, the press, from one, one Zionist organization. You know what they get from the Palestinian side? You know, once a couple of times a year, there's like a day where activists go in and try to talk to staffers and that, that sort of thing. Nobody's competing with that. Nobody's even trying. And unless that happens, unless we can create that, and quickly, 
then we're not going to see change unless we can create a place, an actual place, with a Palestinian flag here in Washington D.C. and and make sure that Palestine exists in Washington D.C. We're going to see more of the same in Palestine. I'm Richard Rubenstein, um, and I want to thank you for this great presentation. Thank you. Um, I want to ask you about the two-state solution. I especially want to ask Ellen because I saw his father speak at the British Embassy, I think it was, in the 80s, sometimes. Um, he gave a very impressive speech, but then I gave him a hard time about the two-state solution. And I, I wanted to ask you a couple of things about that. One, um, the two-state solution is now being presented by opponents of the, by, by many advocates of the ceasefire, even in Gaza, as the, as the way to go. Uh, Jeffrey Sachs is a friend of the uh, now kind of obsessed with the idea. And so I wanted you to say some more about why you think it's, it's impossible. But second, um, I, I wanted to mention also, uh, especially since I teach conflict resolution, that when people talk about the one state solution, uh, that is by most people, it's automatically seen as a, as, as a state in which the, Druid, the Jewish community would basically be driven out of the Middle And there's, no, there's very little understanding that it's possible to have a, a single state with equal rights for everybody where certain communal rights are recognized. So I'm wondering what we can do to kind of make it clear that a Jewish state should you know, it's so time to end the Jewish state, but not a single state doesn't have to necessarily be an anti-Jewish state. Yeah, I mean, you make a good point. My father, like I said, uh, from the fifth day, the end of the 1967 war until he died in 1995, that was he dedicated his life. Now, my question is, what are the virtues of the two-state solution? My father would say, being a Zionist, is that it preserves the Jewish state on 80% of Palestine that was stolen in 1948. It legitimizes the ethnic cleansing of 1948. And it allows for some, you know, recognition of Palestinian rights. Fine. But I still, I, I'm not convinced by that. I don't know what are the virtues of the two-state solution, number one, as opposed to having a democracy with equal rights. Why should Palestinians accept the two-state solution? I have no, I, I can't even think of a reason for them to accept it. Why should people accept that another nation stole their country, living in their homes, living in their cities, and they are confined to a small portion of their country, you know, under conditions that was, were imposed on them by somebody else, within borders that were imposed on them by somebody else? Because the two-state solution presupposes that Palestinians need to agree to live within the confines of boundaries that Israel established. The West Bank is not, doesn't have natural boundaries. It was never there. Israel drew these when they decided where they wanted their boundaries to be in 1949. That was it. Same with the Gaza Strip. Before 1948, there was no such thing as the Gaza Strip. Israel you know, drew it on a map. So why should Palestinians accept it? What are the virtues? But maybe the more interesting question might be, how is it going to work exactly? How's it going to work? Israel, there's no West Bank anymore. So there is no West Bank. Israel made absolutely sure there will not be a West Bank. So there's no West Bank. There is what Israel calls Judea and Samaria, which are completely integrated with Israel. Uh, the highway system, the shopping malls, the, the, you know, the cities and towns built there, completely integrated, except as it's defined by Israeli bureaucracy, there are pockets of an alien population within Judea and Samaria. That's the only problem. Now these pockets of an alien, now the, the, alien, the alien population are the three and a half million Palestinians living in ghettos there. They're the aliens, you understand the, the psychology. So how is exactly going to work? They're going to take all of, they're going to just, you know, who's going to do this? It also presupposes there could be an Israeli government that would agree to recognize the rights of Palestinians to self-determination. Well, if you recognize it in Ramallah and in Hebron, well, what about Yaffa and Haifa and, and all these other cities where Palestinians still reside? So it makes no sense. I don't know what the virtues of it are, and I don't think anybody can, can, can explain those. And it's, 
impossible, an absolutely impossible um, scenario. People refer to it when they don't want to tell the truth, which is that either support racism and support Israel or reject racism and support a free democratic state with equal rights. And the only people that assume or that state that a single state with equal rights will harm Jews are Zionists because they don't want it to happen. They say, well, we have to protect the Jews. Well, history shows us that the Palestinians are the ones that need to be worried, not the Jews and the, not the Israeli citizens. It's like a fake goal to justify avoiding and protecting the real source of the problem, which is Zionism. That's why Tony Blinken, when he was on his mega tour, anti-diplomacy tour in the Middle East to prevent a ceasefire, was constantly talking about a two-state solution for which there is no constituency in the Holy Land and for which there is no physical possibility. As Miko said, there are entire cities built around East occupied East Jerusalem, Ariel, Mali Adumim, whose master plan cuts the West Bank in half. So if we have a two-state solution based on this principle of ethnic, ethno-religious separation, are we to believe that hundreds of thousands of Jews are going to have to just leave these cities that they've built with giant universities and medical centers in the West Bank? And they're not going to freak out and say this is the Holocaust and resist it at all costs? No, it's just simply impossible. It, they've made it impossible by design, as Netanyahu said in his appeal to the Israeli public. He said, keep me here. I know you don't like me. You're mad at me for October 7th. But I, more than anyone, prevented a two-state solution by manipulating the Americans. That's what now he's proudly saying what he once said in private. And that is popular. Go ahead. Yeah. Is it turned on? It is, yeah. I must say, I don't, uh, yeah, I don't fully agree with what's been said about the two state solution. The problem is the Steel Commission in 1937 was generally commended for its impartiality. And the key recommendation of the Peel Commission was there needs to be partition. There also needs to be simultaneous recognition of a Palestinian state uh, to provide security against further Jewish incursions. And that was right then, and it's right now. And it is within the power of the United States to do a fairly simple thing, it seems to me, and that is to recognize the Hamas government or whatever government the Palestinians on the West Bank and in Gaza and in the North can agree upon as a state <laughs> with the immunity, the international immunities that such states have. What the boundaries are. Uh, probably begins with, if not the field commissions, with the UN resolutions, perhaps as modified around Hebron. And the 500,000 settlers on the West Bank either will have to move or assimilate. And what are the virtues of all this? What are the virtues of all this? The virtues of it all are that they are realistic in the sense, please don't interrupt. I, no, no, I just asked. You. No, no, I'm just asking. No. Well, you're kind of holding the, forth. The I mean, this is our show. The <laughs> We're the anti-Semitic Jews, so come on. <laughs> the virtues of it very simply are that it may actually be realizable in this short run. There is certainly Wait a minute, no was the no Peel Commission no realizable? No improvement to be gained because, geez, by denying geez. international recognition to a Palestinian state. And that has been the policy for 50 years. Which is well, I, I appreciate that spirit. But the Peel Commission is partly what triggered the Arab revolt. The Peel Commission was rejected by the Palestinian polity because it handed over key assets and a majority of land to the Jewish colonial minority before the ethnic cleansing of 1948. It is what led to the first spate of violence against the colonial presence, both British and Zionist, in the Holy Land by Palestinians. Because it was so unfair, it ended over Haifa. 
to the Jewish colonizers. It basically threw the Palestinians back into the hinterlands. And that was even before, and that was before 1948. Let's make, let's, let's make another point about it. I know a little something about that. Guided spirit in the Jewish It's turn. Okay, well, we can talk more. Uh, I'm happy to talk more with you at the table, the drink table. I hope that it's over. I was going to make another point, but, man. Okay, I just want to say, I think you're going to have to Thank you. If you've traveled in the West Bank, as I have, for a couple of weeks, 10 or 12 years ago, there is no more two-state solution whatsoever possible. Hundreds of checkpoints, thousands, of, hundreds of thousands of settlers have already taken what might have been the second state, whether anybody wants it or not. I have to say, throwing ice or wet blanket over a one state, because I can of when I was there 10 or 12 years ago, that was what looked possible. That's what looked like the ideal <laughs> one democratic state with rights for everybody. It's gone now with the hatred that has been brought today, I think. I just don't see these people ever living in peace. Yeah. So I have a solution, which would, should have been the solution back in the early 20th century, in the mid 20th century, in the post war period which was let everyone come to the United States. Where were we offering? You've left the elephant in the room unmentioned. Everyone? The Holocaust not has not been mentioned. And the Holocaust story is what makes Israel palatable. We should have offered visas to all the European Jews. They don't right want like that. And I think we should offer I'll a green Israel. card to everybody in this situation today. Well, uh, that's assuming Palestinians want to leave Palestine and come to America, and I don't think they do. Well, the Jews, let's give the Jews. And I'm sure many of the Israelis don't either. Uh, I mean, look, let me let me let me put it this way. Let's pretend for a minute that this is 1988 or 1989, and somebody's standing behind the podium and saying, "In five years, Nelson Mandela will be president of a free, post-apartheid South Africa." How many people do you think would say, "Yeah, that sounds reasonable. That sounds like it's doable." None. Not even one. Now, when when it starts, it, it goes very fast. Are we at that point right now? We don't know yet. I think I think October seventh presents presented us with a possibility to push beyond what we're seeing today and what we think today is possible to a point where this becomes possible. The other thing is this, I think many people think that creating a, a free democratic Palestine with equal right, we need to wait for the Israelis to agree. Well, again, let's take South Africa. How many white South Africans were willingly happy and just woke up one day saying, let's end apartheid today? No. South Africa was on its knees. Cuba sent tanks to Angola to start rolling back the apartheid regime, right? They had massive support from certainly the Eastern Bloc and so forth. South Africans couldn't play sports anywhere. They couldn't participate in any arena, culturally, academically, diplomatically, athletic. You know, they couldn't go anywhere. They were on their knees. The clerk was not a hero that deserved, you know, the Nobel Peace Prize. He was on his knees and had nowhere to go. And so he stood up one day and he said, we're going to unban all the political parties. We're going to free all the political prisoners. And we're going to call for a one person, one vote election. That was the end of apartheid. And I tell, I'm telling you, if we do the right thing, if we demand sanctions, if we pursue the idea of boycotting Israel and not allowing Israel to participate in all these arenas, then we will see Israeli society on its knees. And it may well be Netanyahu who stand up, stands up behind a podium one day and says, we are freeing all the political prisoners, we are unbanning the political parties, and we're calling for a one person, one vote election over all of Palestine. And I'll say just one last thing, and that is, that the challenges that were faced by South Africa with 40 million impoverished black Africans that never had the chance to go to school does, don't, don't exist in Palestine. You have two highly educated societies, two societies that have traditions of democracy, two societies that can create a functional, productive democracy the next day. So I absolutely think it is possible. Uh, thank you. As a concession, it's certainly for life. Uh,
Our salon to a close, and let's give a standing ovation to Bravo! Me.